Well, thank you so much, everybody. We're in the home stretch here. Oh, it's all high for me. Thank you so much for staying. Um, I love this panel. I don't know if many of you know this, but I've been doing this for about 10 years. Maybe this panel, too. Um, and I really like this panel because I think it's really a catch-all for everything that we talked about here um, at the event, and it really goes through. Yeah, I'm too little. Yeah, I'm um, and I, yeah, I love this panel. I'm always last, so I got to be more exciting. I got to give you good, some good stuff. Um, be, besides me, I have an amazing group of panelists. Um, and yeah, the, the, the panel's Global Investment Outlook Top Opportunities. So we really want to cover some really cool stuff. Um, uh, with that, I want to have each of my panelists introduce themselves, because I don't want to keep you here for a long time. But with the, I also ask them along introducing themselves, their firm, their experience, to give us a fun fact that they can take you into happy hour with as well. So, do you guys ready? Are you ready for your fun facts too? How fun can I make? Just, it's gotta be moderately fun because like too fun may not be for this audience. So keep it light. <laughs> shall, I, shall I go first? Yeah. Well, I'm getting, I'm getting suntan here from these, uh, these lights. I uh, can't see the audience. Yeah, I, I'm not sure it's a fun fact, but um, I, I probably had a bit of an experience of being in a Victorian prison because I, um, I went to a boarding school in the north of England, and uh, we had uh, cast iron beds, had a matron. <laughs> she used to give me TCP gargle when I'd hurt my ankle, so uh, I think I had a nice experience there. So, fun fact about me. That's awesome. Was that right. selfish? No, that's really good, but tell us about your firm, too, and yourself. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, me, yeah, so I, I'm, I, <laughs> <laughs> the important bit. So, I'm Jason Griffin, I'm from uh, Han ETF. We are Europe's largest and oldest uh, white label ETP provider. Um, I say ETP because we can launch um, various types of products, so there's nothing we can't do. Uh, we can launch ETFs on our ETF um, platform, and their usage funds, so those of you who don't know Europe, they're like the four chat fund. Uh, if it doesn't fit the usage regulations, let's say it's you know, more than two times levered or inverse, uh, we have another platform we can launch uh, more exciting products, crypto, digital assets. Uh, I could even wrap a US uh, ETFs, if you like, um, on, that, on that platform. I could do physical metals. Oh, I've just seen Joe over there. He, he's the guy that helps us wrap the uh, US uh, ETFs. So um, we could do that. Uh, physical, physical commodities, and we could do all of that. And then also, the extra bit we offer is, because it's such a battle out there, as we all know, raising assets, we can help you with the marketing and distribution in, in Europe. And also, we've got various models. You'll have to come talk to me later. We've got various models. We can either put you on our commingled uh, uh, issuance vehicle, or we can build you your own issuance vehicle, depending what, you know, how large you are, what your ambitions are, how long you want to be married to me for. Uh, you don't have to marry me for life, you know, you can leave us, uh, the contract does allow that. So, um, yeah, brief intro to me, I'll try and... Uh, no, that was excellent. I get a lot of questions on partnering with firms to launch ETFs, especially with the explosion of active. So, definitely seek out Jason. We'll get on uh, to that. Exactly. Um, Simeon, I know, I know you have a fun fact. So. Yeah, give it, well, give it first to I'll us. just do a little pro shares riff. I would have said we were a $75 billion ETF firm, but uh, thanks to the election, we are an $80 billion ETF firm. So uh, we are, thank, thank you. Uh, most of you know us, of course, for our leverage and inverse funds. TQQ is often the uh, highest volume security on the U.S. exchange. Uh, but we also have lots of other stuff. We've got a suite of crypto ETFs. And then for the last 15 plus years, we've been developing center of the plate for us, dividend growth, and a uh, recently launched suite of high income ETFs. Uh, fun fact, uh, I once played Sweet Home Alabama with Artemis Pyle on drums and, well, his son was on drums, but then Artemis came in, Chris is his son. Artemis came in and sat in, and I played Sweet Home Alabama with the drummer from Lynette Schooner, that's my fun fact. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Katrina, I know you only got the memo on the fun fact like five seconds ago, but I, I, know, you're, I know you're ready for I it. I did, but I have one. Is this thing on? Yeah. Um, so my fun, f well, I'll go, for, I'll go my name and firm first, yeah. then we'll do fun facts. My name's Katrina Schmaltz. Uh, I work at Nuveen. We are a trillion dollar asset manager. We offer investment products in a number of different wrappers uh, and asset classes. Our heritage uh, is in municipal bonds, so that's probably what you know us for, but we also have a fairly expansive ETF lineup. We have launched fixed income, or active fixed income ETFs uh, this year, and we have a suite of ESG ETFs. Um, and, my, and my role within the firm is I'm a portfolio strategist. So I work with our global investment committee. They're the folks at the firm who distill our macro views, the heads of all the asset classes, 
um, and I sit alongside them on my team. We figure out how to play all of these themes within a portfolio. Um, my fun fact, thank goodness I do have one, um, is I've done the uh, world's um, highest commercial bungee jump in South Africa. It was wow. literally if all your friends are jumping off a bridge, hide. would you? And I did. So. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Mark. It's, it's you. All right. Uh, pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Mark Zuccaro. I'm Managing Principal and Portfolio Manager at Golden Eagle Strategies. Golden Eagle is a hyper-growth stock manager. Uh, our journey began over 40 years ago when our founder started producing cutting-edge research, quantitative research at the time, uh, into the growth stock segment, and he also managed a number of record portfolios. Um, more recently, we have focused on hyper-growth stocks, which is really the best opportunity that we've seen to date. Uh, and in the past years, we've really uh, honed down on that. Um, hyper-growth is, as the name suggests, at the upper end of the growth range. Um, but that's where the similarity to growth stocks stops. Um, hyper-growth stocks are defined as companies that are delivering top-line growth of 40% uh, quarter over quarter. And our research shows that during the time that these stocks become hypergrowth, they produce average annualized returns of 36%. Now, hypergrowth is probably best explained by what it's not. Hypergrowth is not uh, representative of tech portfolios. Uh, it's not a FANG or a Magnificent Seven investment either, um, which is very different from the, uh, the rest of the growth market. Um, hypergrowth occurs in all sectors of the economy at all times, and they are sector agnostic, they're market capitalization agnostic, although they tend to happen in the uh, upper end of mid cap to large cap range. And you know, we really think this is an exciting opportunity. This is an opportunity for investors to add alpha to their portfolios where uh, the diversification is kind of built in because of the sector mix that is actually uh, available in uh, across the realm of hyper growth stocks. So, you're not leaning into or skewing your portfolio by adding a alpha generating asset. And this is something that we operate in the private markets right now where we have a limited partnership, but we're looking to move into the public realm. And that's why I'm here at ETF Forum, ETP Forum. So you'll be new to ETFs, but can you also share with us your fun fact? My fun fact. <laughs> um, I have been struck by lightning twice, <laughs> sort of. And I'm just going to let that hang out there for a bit. All right. Well, you're still here, so you're going to launch that hypergrowth ETF. Um, all right. So let's get right into it. So I think there's no more exciting time to talk about market trends than probably this month, right, with everything that's going on. Um, and Katrina, since that is you know, like what you focus on, I'd love to hear about what you think the key market trends are and what you will anticipate to shape the rest of 2024 and into 2025. Sure. So I think coming out of COVID, the macroeconomic regime was characterized by higher inflation, higher interest rates, ultimately higher growth, right? Um, and most market watchers and, and, and folks who tried to predict these things um, were all kind of waiting for this recession that really never arrived. And one of the reasons that uh, partially would be what the S&P looks like today, what the economy looks like today, and its orientation around services, right? And in particular, why haven't we seen this recession in the face of really high interest rates that were designed really to slow the economy down? So there seems to be less interest rate sensitivity in the U.S. economy today than we perhaps initially expected. Right, there's still the econ U.S. economy is still interest rate sensitive, um, but maybe it's less so. And why is that? So if we look at the top ten um, largest companies today, they're mostly services. If you look at the top ten country uh, companies in the S and P 20, 30 years ago, those were mostly manufacturing stocks, which certainly have you know interest rate uh, sensitivity. But again, with the services orientation, that could be one of the reasons why the U.S. economy keeps continuing to move forward. Um, but what has maintained uh, it's this interest rate sensitivity is bond math, right, like fixed income. 
Uh, we all saw that in 2022. Uh, there's some mental, been some mental scarring around that. So how we're structuring fixed income sleeves today is looking at diversified, durable income, right? We think we, ha we have to let fixed income just be a, a yield game, right? I don't know that hanging out in the belly or the, the longer end of the curve um, and just clipping coupon is going to cut it um, in this, again, this macroeconomic regime that is also characterized by high interest rate volatility, right? The, the volatility of interest rates has really been elevated the last couple of years as well. So I think with all that interest rate volatility, we're gonna need some more coupon to cushion um, your returns. So to us, that means, you know, in the ETF space, we have um, a high yield ESG ETF. We just launched a active preferred ETF. We launched a core plus ETF. Um, so building in those different fixed income <coughs> plus sector asset classes into really any fixed income sleeve, um, I think is gonna continue to work this year and as we move, uh, we move forward. That's wonderful. And Mark, I know you had some thoughts earlier, more on probably on the equity side. Do you agree on some of the things that are happening in the fixed income side? Or do you have some other thoughts that you see as well for key trends that are gonna be coming up? the rest of the year and, and forward? We tend not to look at specific events. We're very much focused on what the stock market does over the long term, and the stock market goes up over the long term. And um, it's important for investors to realize that um, it's very easy to, to go down the slippery slope of market timing, and um, there will be things that happen in 2025 and beyond that uh, are going to happen. Elections happen, uh, natural disasters happen, wars happen, but the, uh, the average bull market now, is, since 1982, which was an inflection point when technology really started to drive the market, um, the average bull market is 5.8 years, and it goes up 220%. The average bear market is 11 months, and it goes down 36%. So. If you keep a long-term view and you stay invested, uh, it's important to realize that you need to just weather the events uh, and avoid the market timing aspect. And Simeon, I'm looking at you because you have a lot of product that kind of covers you on both sides. And we you're got always stuff. innovating. We, so we got stuff. Yeah. But uh, you said something very interesting uh, about 2022. And I think a lot of us in this room probably bear scars from 2022 when stocks and bonds went down together. And that caused a, a frenzy of looking for any port in the storm, you know, whether it was a fixed income strategy that was somehow going to protect you or whether it was a lower volatility equity strategy. But we don't live in that world anymore. We don't, it doesn't really matter so much what the path of the Fed is. I mean, you could argue they're gonna get to 3% sooner or later. But one thing we do know is the 10-year Treasury is almost 4.5%. And by the way, that's its long-term average. So if we're all wrong about this bull market, then something bad happens, your bonds are going to go up 10 or 15%. That 10-year is going to go from 45 to 3%. In other words, asset allocation will now be efficacious in a way that it has not been able to be in a generation. So we've got a little sort of tagline that we've been operating with for the last few months, and it's simply let your bonds be bonds and let your stocks be stocks. And very specifically on the stock side, what we mean by that is watch out for these really low volatility equity strategies that just aren't gonna participate. You don't need them now that the stocks are there. But guess what you do need on the equity side? You pro if you needed a little equity income before, you probably need a little more now because Powell just gave you a salary cut on the short end and on the long end, you can't completely load up on the long end just in case anything goes wrong. So one of the things that we were really pleased to bring to the market about a year ago uh, was a suite of high income ETFs. And the opportunity that we saw was we looked at the traditional covered call market, the market where you write monthly calls. And if you look at that marketplace, the VXM is the monthly, is the index of a classic monthly covered call strategy in the S&P 500. It has delivered one third of the equity market returns over the last decade. That is not stocks being stocks. And what we saw was an innovation in the capital markets. The inception of daily options on a range of indices in the US. Turns out if you execute a covered call strategy on a daily basis, you get beta one. 
and you get double digit income. And that's what we were pleased to do. S&P's got our, the index, the S&P 500 daily covered call index, and we launched the uh, ETF ISPY or iSPY to give people the opportunity to supplement the income from their fixed income portfolio, but still have that instrument really behave like stocks. And that's part of what we think is important going into 2025. No, that's really, that rounds out a lot of the discussion. And I know, Jason, you're more on the Europe side. And I know you don't focus specifically on market strategy, but what are some of the products that you see coming out in this environment on the pipeline um, on the European side? Yeah, you're, you're quite right. I mean, we're in a fortunate position that um, we don't have to come up with our own strategies and ideas. We have wonderful asset managers around the world who come to us with their, their strategy ideas, their passion, their IP, and we can turn those into uh, investable ETFs. So, but in terms of what we're seeing, um, definitely been an increase, certainly this year, big sort of explosion into active, e uh, people looking at active ETFs, which I guess a few years ago uh, was a bit of an oxymoron, but now everyone's looking at that. Fixed income's back on. Uh, fixed income went quiet for a while, and then suddenly a lot of active fixed income and some more sort of niche strategies, you know, of certain sectors of uh, the fixed income landscape, people who are specialists in certain sectors. Um, well, just as you're saying here, you know, covered call, lots of option-based strategies. And I think many of these uh, ideas are sort of coming over, rippling over from across the pond from the U.S. So, uh, you know, covered call strategies, medicines from downside protection strategies, uh, people maybe hunting for yields so that people are building products for that uh, with the covered calls, but options-based strategies active. Probably the two, two hottest products um, you know, that we're sort of seeing now. No, that's interesting. I mean, that, that's pretty interesting to see all those trends together hitting Europe as well, right? So you're seeing, and you're, are the type of issuers that you're seeing launch these products, are they similar to those in the U.S., or is it a, a, a very different set of invest, uh, asset managers? Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of both. I mean, um, we, you know, a lot of U.S. asset managers are looking at Europe. You know, Europe's twice the population and, you know, similar wealth demographics. So if you want to tap into the market in Europe, it's, um, it's still... A few years behind the U.S., retail is still pretty nascent, but retail's growing. Everyone wants to be a part of that. So, you know, ETF managers in the U.S., they already love ETFs. They know what they're all about, want to come to Europe. And then obviously European managers now looking at that, active managers looking at that. So uh, yeah, there's a lot, lot ripples over from the U.S. for sure. You know, we're a few years behind on most things other than spot Bitcoin, uh, spot digital assets. We were ahead of the U.S. on that one. We're probably still ahead on uh, ESG, but generally uh, the U.S. is a bit ahead. So, yeah, things ripple across. We see that, you know, active exploded here a couple of years ago, probably, or more, and it's uh, really just starting to explode in, in Europe. No, I agree with you. We see that in RC, too. As we talk to more and more issuers, not only they're looking to launch in the U.S., but they already have their, their plan globally in place as well. Um, so from just, just turning t uh, to the type of investment strategies maybe your firms are focused on, um, uh, maybe, Katrina, I'll start with you because you have a multitude of products. Are there any focused products that you think are probably geared best for these, this environment going forward? Sure. I think um, I'll stick with active fixed income. I think, you know, especially if we think of while we've avoided, you know, a higher tax uh, regime uh, for next year, if you think about, you know, a mutual fund fixed income product in a non-qualified account, um, that income is taxed at ordinary rates. Then you have the fund fee, and then you don't have create, redeem, or in kind of bull to, to um, not distribute cap gains. So the after-tax income of those products are, is really rough, right? The after-tax returns there are not attractive. Um, so I think with the advent of active fixed income ETFs, you can at least alleviate a layer of some of those fees. And if you look at municipal bond ETFs, you can eliminate you know, the most offensive uh, income there, which is the ordinary income. And then you get some tax efficiency w via the ETF wrapper. Um, so I think that is only going to, you know, I think the adoption of active fixed income ETFs in non-qualified accounts versus active mutual funds is only going to increase as we, move, as we move ahead. And that, that includes all the sectors, including the municipals. Absolutely. We've seen that too. The, like some of the biggest kind of launches we've seen are on the structured product CLO side and the muni as well. Um, so Simeon, I know you have a multitude of products as well that you guys are putting out, running. Are there any specific products you guys um, are highlighting to be for investors, which I know you are, uh, for this year, but also into the next year as well? Uh, indeed. I, I mentioned our high income suite. And in addition to uh, iSPY, ISPY, which is our S&P 500 high income ETF, we've also got IQQ, which is a daily covered call strategy and a NASDAQ. And we recently launched 
I2, ITWO on the Russell 2000. Why did we launch a suite? We launched a suite because for the first time it's relevant. Because in other words, if you look at a traditional covered call strategy, your performance is so eviscerated that it doesn't really matter. You could write monthly calls on the S&P, on the Russell 2, on Argentinian equities, Malaysian equities, Korean equities. It doesn't really matter because you ain't getting that. But now with the daily covered call approach, you really are getting the performance of the underlying. And as an example, we got the timing right on I2 because the Russell 2 is rocking. And we do believe that that's a real opportunity, not just a false dawn, because let's go back to the relationship between the fixed income side and the equity side. For large cap stocks, I would argue that the Fed doesn't matter too much because valuations for large cap stocks are really much more driven by the long end of the curve. And I've been saying for years, what's the average long-term yield on the 10-year treasury? Kindergarten math, two plus two is four, 2% 2 real and 2% uh, inflation. And then somebody on my team ran it for the last 30 years and said, I need to update you, it's four and a half. Okay, fine, it's somewhere between four and a half, four and four and a half, but we're there. So in other words, we're probably in a range bound place on the long end, which means that the market, the, the S&P 500 is probably not gonna react that much to the Fed. But small caps, I would argue, still will, because there's where the leverage is and shorter dated paper. So I think there's a real opportunity. Of, of course, we've got valuation. It, it, this rally has done nothing. Price to book on the Russell 2 is half of the S&P 500, but that's been true for about five years now. But when you combine the Fed and a little bit of an extra domestic focus that might be a little resistant to in case the tariffs get a little wacky, you really have a good environment for small caps as part of the broadening of the market, for which it's really cool that you can now actually have a covered call strategy on the Russell 2 that will really behave like the Russell 2000. I would, I would add also, um, I mentioned preferreds and I mentioned active fixed income and one of the things about our preferred ETF, it has the same named PM as our mutual fund product. Um, he's been able to manage some pretty high percentage QDI. So it's, that's another asset class that if there's active management, it's attractive in a non-qualified account. Um, with the results of the election, uh, we think there's gonna be, it's gonna usher in a, a deregulatory environment where some of the most um, regulated companies in the US, banks, uh, banks are the biggest issuers of preferreds, right? And we also think we're gonna see some yield curves steepening in general, but certainly because of the presidential election and banks make their money right on uh, net interest margin. So we think banks are attractive and because of that, we think preferreds are an area of the fixed income markets that are gonna be set to benefit. I love that. And, and did you wanna start? I was gonna hit one of you. Maybe you have a comment. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna quickly comment as well. Just, you know, obviously we do sell products. We build them for everybody, but we also sell them. And you know, the ones that are kind of flying off the shelves at the moment probably are We've got a future of defense ETF, which I guess is no surprise with what's going on geopolitically around the world. It's got a really cool ticker as well. It's NATO, because it invests in, you have to be in a NATO country. You got that ticker, NATO. Huh? NATO, yeah, it's pretty cool, yeah. Uh, we, like, we like our tickers. We used to have a space ETF, Yoda. Um, I thought Disney might come after us for that. But um, yeah, so NATO's just, yeah, taking off, as you'd expect with everything that's going on in the world, and, and that's not gonna change anytime soon, so that's doing super well. And then also, I guess, again, because of, of where we are in the world, um, our uranium miners ETF does very well, because again, people are looking at how we're gonna decarbonize the planet. The wind doesn't always blow. Uh, you know, they turn the coal power stations back on, uh, you know, when Putin turned off the gas in Europe, and people thought, wow, putting the coal back on. So, um, you know, uranium went from probably being, you know, seen as a dirty fuel to, to you know, now being topical. So, they're probably two of the themes that if, in what we're selling today that are probably uh, moving as quickly as uh, the, the rest of them. That's super, that's a very interesting. I mean, you see a kind of the wisdom of the crowds, ideas come through your way. So yeah. I love you sharing that with us. And then Mark, I was gonna pick on you specifically because you're, you're new to the space. You're talking about something we haven't talked a lot about, which is alts, right? And we also know you were on the private side, another very hot topic. And then also we wanna know if you've picked out your ticker yet, as you could see how important that is. Um, if not, we could talk about ideas after, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on private markets going into public, and then also so, uh, your, your thoughts on alts, is that okay? Look, we, we've been operating in the alt space for uh, a while, and, and the one thing that's really interesting um, is this uh, obsession with managing volatility. Um, 
there's so many people out there, investors, institutional, uh, family office, that think they're trying to find uh, you know, 15 to 18% annualized returns while managing volatility down. And it's just kind of a pipe dream. And if you want to make outsized returns, if you want to beat the markets, you need to accept some form of volatility. The industry, uh, if you, you know, whether you're talking about the alt world or they teach it in the CFA course, you know, we, we, we equate risk with volatility and risk-adjusted returns and terms like uh, standard deviation and sharp. Um, if you want to generate returns, you need to uh, try not to engineer volatility out of it because volatility is what makes portfolios go up and you need to capture the upside uh, of that. The Dow was trading uh, in 1982, is trading around 1,000. Uh, it's up, uh, went through 44,000 this week. Um, and as an example, you know, it hasn't been a smooth ride. It's been bumpy, of course. Um, but the reason that has happened and the reason why you have such incredible growth in, in the stock market is be for two, two things. Number one, the frequency of upside movements is greater than the frequency of downside movements. And number two, the, mo uh, the uh, magnitude of upside movements is greater than the magnitude of downside movements. When you consider compounding and all of that, it's really the greatest wealth generation machine that you can find. And maybe, you know, uh, you know uh, high volatile stocks are not your core holding. Maybe you're not comfortable with it. We happen to hold quite a lot of them. But it's something that should be in every portfolio because the S&P has returned uh, historically 10.5% uh, over the long term. In the past 10 years, it's returned 12%. So that means if you're in some sort of um, hedged product where you are um, you know, getting modest but stable returns, and one year you happen to have 0% return, it means you need to generate 24% in the subsequent year or two to uh, be able to catch up to the indices. So it's important to stay in an asset class that, um, that does generate high returns. It's important to weather the storm. Uh, you know, it's important to have a strong stomach in this business and uh, to understand that over the long term, time mitigates risk and you need to accept that risk uh, if you want to generate returns. And I think the coming year or two is going to be very, very interesting for the upper end of growth stocks. Um, and I think uh, we're looking forward to it. The opportunity is already in progress right now. Uh, you know, our portfolio has been flying, but I think uh, we're going to see continued uh, upswings for the, for the next uh, stage of the bull market, too. I have one more question for you because you have a little bit of a fresh eye on the industry, right? You're coming in new. Um, there's been a real growth, and hopefully it's okay for you to answer this question. I think we talked about it prior, so I'm hoping. But there's been a real you know, popularity in these structured complex type, pro uh, structured products, non-options-based uh, strategies. I know you had some particular views on that, given when you said you must weather that volatility. Yeah, look, I, I think everybody's going to use uh, uh, a variety of different products in their portfolio. Uh, I think there's a place for that. But I think at some place, there's some place for your portfolio where you need to, um, you know, uh, you know, not try to hedge out risk or hedge out um, the uh, potential downside because it's going to mean slower growth over the long term. I mean, a retirement account is a great place for this type of thing, right? Um, number one, it's, it's uh, tax efficient. Number two, you're probably not going to need to access that money now. We talked a little bit before about, um, you know, target date funds and, you know, a lot of these, the, the, the uh, conventional wisdom is that you, by the time you hit retirement age, you need to be very, very heavily invested in fixed income because you need to, you can't weather the volatility. But there are a lot of retirees out there who are living to, into their 80s or 90s and they're just running out of money because they have not been properly invested. And, and you know, people are, you know, 75% in fixed income by the time they hit 62, 65 years old. And guess what? You know, sometimes they need to downsize because the kids have flown the nest. And sometimes they need to downsize because they 
uh, you know, can't support themselves in their current lifestyle. So, um, you know, I think retirement accounts, and I think even in your everyday portfolios, you need to have some component of risk that's going to jump around, but that's going to deliver high returns over the long term. I, just add, yeah. oh, I was just going to add something super quick on the, the longevity comment. It's just a kind of a random fact, but it's, it's funny. The um, average retirement of the uh, couple who is retiring at 65 today, um, the lifespan of their retirement is 26.2 years. So like a literal marathon of uh, that your assets have to run in that retirement period. So I just agree with the, the risk taking point. It's um, tough to, even from a fixed income shop, it's tough to be all fixed income in, in that period. I think there's always um, a prudent case to be made for some equities in a retirement account. Yeah, I, I'll do a pile on on that, but with a, with a little bit of a uh, perspective that we call income now and income later. Precisely for this reason, because you hit 65 and you got 30 years to go, you have to take something in the ballpark of equity risk for a decent part of your portfolio, but you may need some income now. We, we talked about our daily covered call strategy, but also you need income later, uh, to which for us, one of the great sources of that are classic dividend growth stocks. You know, we've got our flagship ticker NOBL, the S&P 500 dividend aristocrats. Of course, it's been left behind by the MAG-7, but what's cool about it is that the dividends have grown historically double digits, compounding, and you need that, a source of income that will actually grow over time so you don't run out of money. And just as an extra little topical footnote for it, because you mentioned financials as being attractive with the steepening yield curve, our small cap dividend grower, which is ticker SMDV, the uh, Russell 2000 dividend growers, we think that's a pretty cool spot because number one, it's high quality small caps, two thirds of Russell 2 doesn't make money, so a little bit of a more stable approach to it. But one of the things that's true about it, which sometimes we're defensive about and sometimes we're aggressive about, it's about 35% small cap financials. We think that's actually a pretty good story right now, particularly with the steepening yield curve. And usually the regional guys, they kind of know their book a little better. If you remember the great financial crisis, the smaller banks didn't want the TARP money because they kind of knew who they were lending money to. So if anybody's got a good handle, it's always been the the smaller guys. So I throw that out as an idea, but absolutely some sort of income now, income later, make sure you got enough risk on the table so you don't run out of money. I'd, I'd add on the dividend growth. They have certainly, they've been left behind uh, by the Magnificent Seven, but historically speaking, the 20, 30 year, the dividend aristocrats, the dividend growers, they've outperformed the S&P with lower vol. They're, it's a very sneaky asset uh, or style of equity investing. Um, that is maybe a little boring, not always exciting to talk about, but it is exciting to outperform the S&P over a long period of time. So that's definitely a, a, a way to keep risk on, but mitigate vol, maybe the best of both worlds. We didn't even coordinate that. Thank I you. know, Thank how about you. it, layup. No, I, I mean, I think any yield type strategies seem to like, you know, test, the, you know, they're, they're, they're through, true and through, right? Um, but besides yield, which I think I agree, you know, we're seeing the same thing, but besides yield, are there any, especially given the environment and maybe any change that you guys see, are there any specific sectors or thematic, thematic or themes that you're seeing that you think are going to kind of emerge or continue uh, in the next year or so? I would, we already talked about it a little bit, but I would just comment or uh, put out there that I don't think the... U.S. political environment, uh, or instead of the, all, in spite of the U.S. political environment, I don't think ESG investing is going to is going to uh, die on the vine. We joke um, in Europe, it's not called ESG investing; it's just called investing, right? So, um, and there's, you know, I think Trump and the Republicans have been a little critical, a little critical of the IRA, uh, but that's accrued benefits to blue and red states. So I think um, there will certainly always be a give and take between clean energy and um, traditional energy, but I do think there is broad global support for decarbonization and that trend will continue. Jason, I think from a European standpoint, you know, I think the key things that you, we used to see as really different from the U.S. versus uh, Europe was ESG, right? It was such a big deal in Europe. And then I've heard now maybe that's come off a bit and maybe not. Is, or what are you seeing with, in terms of your seat? I mean, I, yeah, it's still, still huge in, uh, in Europe. There's, there are allocators out there who will only um, buy you know, ESG, 
ETF portfolios. They'll um, they'll they'll sort of screen for you know ESG. We have we have a way of rating them in in Europe. But, you know different art articles six, eight, nine, and they will sc they will screen on that. But you're quite right. You know some investors have also seen underperformance in some of those ESG portfolios, and so uh, maybe shying away and just thinking, well, as the guys are saying, you know, we've got a safe retirement here, so uh, there's some shying away. But no, it's not going to go away in Europe. It's uh, particularly uh, some some of the countries, you know, that you know, in the Nordics and the Netherlands, that you know, they're just huge, huge into this stuff. The pension plans everywhere, so it's not going away anyway, anytime soon in Europe. And is that what you're seeing based on the issuers that are trying to come to you and launch through your platform? Are you seeing some ESG products come yeah. in? Definitely in in the index space, 100%. Uh, when it comes to active, some people like to have a bit more flexibility in the active space. They don't want to be too constrained. So, uh, that, you know, they might argue that their that their active that you know their, their, their philosophy, how they build portfolios, takes ESG into account. But they don't want to explicitly say, "I am going to stick to this um, article, whatever it might be, to uh, you know to, to deliver that." So they want to be a bit more flexible. I think. Mark, you don't have to ask, answer this question, but do you care about ESG in your strategies at all? It doesn't really impact anything that we do. Yeah. So uh, as long as they have hyper growth, we're yeah. hyper growth, hyper growth, hyper growth. Uh, so, so you're exactly that. Like what, what investors were worried about in ESG when they were underperforming energy and all those things, right? Yeah. For you, you would have been fully invested, going hard on those on those names. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we uh, we're just, you know, because we're a systematic stock picker. Sometimes we don't even know the companies that we're buying. We don't look at the financials. We don't look at the story behind it. We care about the numbers um, because we know that if we're investing in a certain type of uh, stock profile, we're going to get a certain return over the long term. And that's what drives our strategy. I wanted to share a little thought. I, usually I don't talk about sectors in any great detail, but something did catch our eye over the last several weeks. and and that is the energy sector. And I, I get that the classic story in the energy sector is you're supposed to buy when energy prices are low. You've got to be a little contrarian about it. And we also have the political possibility of drill, baby, drill, and all that stuff. But uh, I observed the following. Uh, energy prices are really low and consensus performance expectations are actually pretty high. If you just pull up the uh, good old FA screen in Bloomberg, gross margin is forecast on a consensus basis to expand in the energy space, in the energy sector, in 2025 over 2024, having already somehow miraculously expanded a little since in 2024 over 2023. I don't get it, I don't know. You know what? Energy is only 5% of the S&P. If you're running an investment policy statement and it makes you anxious, you can get rid of it. And they're actually, we, we, we did this with ProShares a number of years ago because we got the short side. And we said, well, maybe we should offer people a package thing if they find it convenient. So we've actually got a few X-sector ETFs. And one of them is sticker SPXE. It's the S&P 500 X Energy ETF. So it's easier than doing the donut hole thing. Like if you didn't like one sector, then you'd have to build it up by buying the other, how many GIX level ones are there? Nine, 10? Yeah. You'd have to buy nine and just leave one out. This way you can just buy SPXE and be out of energy. That's probably a little contrarian view, but just caught our eye of late. Any thoughts on sectors? Anything before I pick topic? topic? Um, look, what we do uh, spans all the sectors. Um, there are a couple of sectors that don't behave, uh, where, where hypergrowth stocks don't behave uh, like the others, but uh, we're sector agnostic. Um, you know, only 15 to 30 percent of our portfolio is in technology at, at any given time. That's not by design, that's by chance. Um, there are really interesting buys uh, across the board. And, um, you know, there's definitely cycles through the sectors, um, and um, we follow the growth where growth is happening. Great. That's, thank you so much. I, I want to touch on something I'm, you, know, you guys don't have to comment on, but I, it is a outlook. I think it, I would, it would, you know, not be right to not mention, you know, AI, any use of AI, any thoughts on AI. Um, we did have a crypto... Uh, panel earlier, blockchain, so I'll just stick with AI unless you want to comment on both, just from your own thoughts, but anybody who wants to start, you're looking at me, so did you, did you want to start? Did you start? You're starting with me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I'll just observe the following little weird thing. 
which will date me. Um, so if anybody's at least as old as I am, raise your hand if you remember the book, The Innovator's Dilemma. Yes, thank you. <laughs> One per And you look younger than me, so that's pretty cool that, that you know that book. Uh, back in the late 90s, there was this, I don't even know who wrote the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, but the idea was that um, incumbent companies would be unable to take advantage of disruptive technologies because they cannibalize their cash cows and they just wouldn't be able to pull it off. And that was indeed an era where many of the big dogs of today actually grew up. Some of them started in the 70s and 80s, but you had some, in, of course, in the tech revolution in the 90s. Uh, it, it seems a little different this time. Uh, it certainly does look like incumbent companies are making money off this thing, whatever it turns out to be. So it's turning that thing on its head. I mean, who's like the youngest company in the headlines for this? I mean, how, how old is Palantir? 10 years old or something? Not, not, not very old. Not very old, so that's like one. But all the rest of them are 30, 40, 50 year old companies. Facebook's what, 30, 30 odd years old at this point. So that to me is interesting. Um, so I, I think that does mean that in your tech exposure, uh, you wanna make sure you have some of the old guard and you can already guess I'm going to throw you a ticker, but of course I got to throw you a ticker. But we do have we do actually have a very funny TF. It's ticker TDV, and it's the S and P Technology Dividend Aristocrats. So we knew that in the S and P 500 Dividend Aristocrats, 25 year bogey for increasing your dividend leaves much of tech out. So our friends at S and P launched the Tech Dividend Aristocrat Index. The bo bogey is seven. You could probably make it ten now and be fine. But here's what I find interesting about dividends in the technology space. First, technology is now punching its weight with regards to its generation of dividends. So well over a quarter of the dividends in the S&P 500 come from the tech sector. So it's almost punching its weight in terms of market cap, uh, its market cap weighting. Number two, dividends are not the same as buybacks. You will hear people all the time conflate the two. It's just money going back to shareholders. I submit the following. You know what a buyback tells you when a company does a buyback? It is telling you it had a good year last year. You know what they're telling you when they increase their dividend? They feel pretty good about next year. So if we're trying to handicap who's expensive for good reasons and not so good reasons, companies are giving you some information. I'm going to turn to you because you're hyper growth. So you probably have a lot of themes. You got a lot of thoughts on that. Well, this is exactly why only a small fraction of our portfolios is technology. When technology first started to take off, obviously it was the technology companies that benefited from it. But that technology has now matured and it has filtered its way down into all the other sectors. So you have materials companies, you have industrials, you have consumer discretionary companies that traditionally would have nothing to do with technology, but they are all using this technology to grow. And hypergrowth, the term was only introduced in 2008 um, in a study uh, or in a publication uh, in Harvard Business Review. But the fact is, it's because companies just really couldn't grow at a 40% rate uh, four or five, six decades ago. Technology has allowed companies, regardless of what they do, to scale. It's allowed them to become more efficient. It's allowed them to uh, generate higher rates of sales, and it has uh, allowed them to uh, maneuver very quickly in a changing economy. And that's why uh, it's important to realize that the, the growth can occur outside of where people think growth traditionally occurs. And that's a really interesting point, right? It's almost like a mini, it's like a different industrial revolution, right? It's taking this. They call it exactly the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah, and I haven't heard that in many of the you know other panels that I've heard, and this just made me really think through a whole different way of looking at AI, not at the surface, but underneath the surface. And another thing about AI, it's important to remember. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people, I'm sure everybody's spoken to a lot of people about AI and what it really is. Is it real? Is it vaporware? Um, it, obviously, it has captivated the headlines. It is, it is really... Um, has everybody in investments and in other industries talking about how it's going to change. But my sense is a lot of people think that AI is not creating the next cyborg. It's not really about teaching uh, machines to think like the human brain. 
It's really just turbocharging what we've always been doing. And if you look at um, investment into the alternative industry, alter, uh, alternative, um, the, the AI sector, um, it's going to be about 200 billion next year. But the lion's share of that is not going into the software side of it, it's going into hardware development. You're seeing it in semis, you're seeing it in um, computing systems. So it's less of a paradigm shift and it's more of an arms race. And we now have the technology, uh, what is it, Moore's Law? that says that um, uh, technology uh, increases in capability exponentially year over year. And I think what we're seeing is a, we're getting really, really good at building good computers to the point where they can do a lot more than just calculations. They can perform real world tasks. And that is helping companies that are not technology companies actually do their jobs better. Love that. I just took an MIT class in AI. And it's exactly what they said. She got her certificate. A yeah, certificate, yeah, just, yeah, nothing good, <laughs> nothing good. Um, no, I just said exactly that. It was gonna be more a tool, not something that's gonna take over. But um, any thoughts from me before? We have about maybe two minutes, maybe max. And yeah, well, just, just the, other, the other aspects of AI that we see is um, AI being used to do the stock picking. So we've spoke, we've spoke to a few, uh, a few clients who've come to us with portfolios where they've used AI to actually build a portfolio. So that's just another, I guess, more of a use of AI rather than you know investing in, in AI. That's a, that's a use there. Seeing that um, actually, so 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 it now they can uh, actually look at what's inside. Even if you obscure your holdings, so people can't see, you know, other than a backward-looking basis, what's in your portfolio. You know, the AI, AI engine with enough data points can work out what's in the portfolio because there's only one way to get that performance. Uh, so they're picking the they're picking the best ideas out, out of that as well. So yeah, AI, AI is being used for we're building portfolios too, it's not just about investing in AI. That's fantastic. And just to add a contrarian point uh, that I don't know I necessarily personally believe in, I think AI will be transformative. I think whatever the analogy is, we're in batting practice, right? We're not even at the innings yet, but um, it, we, you mentioned like 200 billion in um, investment into AI. Um, but AI, I, I believe largely is gonna be deflationary. So if you wanna create a case against AI and AI investment, it's like there's been this huge upfront cost to support AI that will be a, a disinflationary impulse to, to companies and pricing uh, um, moving forward. So there, you know, could there be a math problem down the road with this huge, huge expensive investment um, that is gonna ultimately probably be de de very deflationary. I love that, love that. Um, last thing to leave the audience with, one quick thing. No, any one quick thing you guys want to say you want to leave the audience with to think about that you think is important, or do you feel like you've said it all? We need rain. Did you, did you smell? I went out on the, on the porch, and I, I smelled the wildfires. So I say we pray for rain. That's my take. -up. Well, if you want to come to Europe, give us a shout. We can uh, get you an ETF out in 10 to 12 weeks, and uh, we've got 350 years of experience in the firm, and I'm half of that. So uh, we're doing pretty well. Mine was going to be a little more serious, oops, but it feels silly now because we're <laughs> almost at half hour. I was going to say one interesting thing I think coming down the, the pipe might be if you look at the private markets, if this democratization of, you know, private markets to, to retail. I was just going to mention, you know, Cambria, what they're doing, um, trying to do something similar in terms of funding uh, ETFs with individual securities, right? You could do that formally. Investment bankers might do it for you. If you were a very high net worth individual, you had concentrated low cost basis position, you could put into something called like an exchange fund with other individuals and you, you give them your concentrated stock and you get back a diversified product, but it was for the, the elite and the highly wealthy. And it, it looks like, I don't know what that ETF is gonna look like, but it looks like it's concepts of that are coming to the ETF landscape, which is just exciting. I, I think uh, You're the in next- south of France, so we'd love, love to hear that. Yeah, I know. Pulled myself away from a bottle of rosé for this. Um, I, I think th things are really, really exciting right now. I mean, the investment business is usually exciting, but um, uh, just looking at what's going on in the ETF realm, I mean, everybody here that's involved with the pipes and the plumbing and the flotation and the maintenance and the idea generation in the ETF world, the stars are very bright for everybody in this room. It's a growing industry. It's nice to be in a growing industry. Um, and, you know, I think it, it gives people a lot of options. Uh, education is key for a lot of these strategies, for a lot of these products. 
Um, I think we're all uh, doing a lot of work on that front, and um, I think it's going to be uh, a fantastic 25, 26 uh, for the investment world. Thank you so much. And my last thought is thank you so much for this audience. You stuck with us. There's only one or two people that left, and happy hour is already going on. Thank you for supporting us, and we're closing the last panel. <laughs>